Do males and females live in different worlds? Hmm. Very good. Do boys and girls, do men and women live in different worlds? I think they do. And I'll tell you why. We're going to talk about that today. Why do we think, why do I think, that boys and girls, men and women, live in different worlds altogether? Well, the first thing to think about is that one of the causes is gynocentrism. Yes, gynocentrism. Gynocentrism runs silent and it runs deep. That sounds like a submarine, eh? That's not a submarine. Gynocentrism. What is it? Let's break it down. Gyno is female. Centrism is centered or around. So basically it's female-centered. In other words, the culture is female-centered. The, the female first kind of mentality is gynocentrism. Hmm, yeah. And you know, there's been a lot of writing lately on gynocentrism. And uh, in fact, if you want to learn more about gynocentrism, go to gynocentrism.com where Peter Wright and others have written some great stuff on it, including a, a fellow named Anti-Gynocentrist. Um, and one of the things they talk about is that, you know, there's this been this myth about how um, we need women more and therefore we protect women because we need them to reproduce and the culture needs that in order to survive. And there's an element of truth in that, but what they point out is uh, that's not the only thing, because guess what? You've got to have men to survive, too. If you don't have men, your culture gets taken over. <laughs> you know, the South American cultures, gracious goodness, they had uh, they had 60%, one tribe had 60% of their men killed in intertribal raids. Well, one of the things they were doing with the intertribal raids was to steal the women, right? So, yes, women are important as far as reproducing, and we've got to have them in order to reproduce and to have a successful culture. But you've got to have men in order to protect things, too. So, both have been very instrumental. And gynocentrism is a complicated mess. You know, I wonder sometimes if there isn't a biological component to gynocentrism, and I think there is. But I think there's so many different components into this that it's overwhelming in some ways. There's biological, there's probably hormonal, genetic, social, who knows what else. There's all kinds of things going on. Where it comes from is less important than what it's doing. What it's doing is tough because, you know, you can't see it. You know, gynocentrism is basically invisible. You cannot see it. It runs silent and it runs deep. That means everybody's got it. Everyone has some of the stuff we call gynocentrism, this female-centered idea. And if you think you don't have any, you've got another thing coming. You know, you've got another thing coming. One of the things I do in workshops I give is, is I do a real quick little, little um, exercise. And I say, okay, imagine you're coming into a, a restaurant. You're being seated in your favorite restaurant. And you're walking through the restaurant and you're being seated. And you see over in the corner table over here, there's a woman crying. What do you think of her? What's your first response? And I'm telling you, I've, taught, I've done this with thousands of therapists that I teach about this stuff. And they all say the same thing. Oh, poor dear. She's upset. She's hurt. She needs support. You get the picture? Right. Now, I say, okay, erase that image. Go back. You're being seated in the same restaurant. You're going walking through the restaurant. At the same corner table over there, you see a man who's crying. What's your first response? <laughs> you know what they'd say? They'd say, oh, there's something wrong with that guy. Step around him. Avoid him. He's probably drunk. Right? Completely different response than the response the woman gets. And the thing that got me was, when I did the exercise for myself at first, I realized, uh-oh, I got the same thing. Because when I see the woman there, this is automatic. This is part of This is... Oh, poor thing. We need to take care of her. When I saw the guy there, I think, ah, you know? So this is a part of me, too. This is not something that is just in feminists. <laughs> this is something that's in all of us. Gynocentrism runs silent, and it runs deep. Now, how can you tell it's there? I mean, how, if it's so silent and deep, how can you even tell it's there? And I can tell you, Paul Elam, Janice Femingo, and myself have been doing Regarding Men episodes now for gosh, by a year and a half. And we've probably done um, close to 80 different episodes. And 
almost after every episode, we come to the same conclusion. We look at each other and we go, gynocentrism, <laughs> you know, because it is embedded in just about every men's issue is this gynocentrism thing. Think about it. Circumcision. We protect the girls, but we don't protect the boys. Hmm. Gynocentrism. Suicide. You know, no one gives a crap about suicide of males, but everyone's worried about the suicide of females. I remember I wrote a letter one time to the uh, National Association for Social Workers and, and uh, complained about this research they'd done on girls and suicide. And I said in the letter, I said, look, you know, the boys are the ones that are committing suicide more often. Why are you studying girls? And they wrote back to me, and guess what they said? They said, we're studying girls because the person who donated the money demanded that the research be on girls. That's what you find. See how it works? I mean, and there's a guy, I forget his name, he was the president of one of the suicide organizations, and he said, it's almost impossible to get funding for suicide in boys. He said, I'd love to find out, but there's no money out there. Why wouldn't there be money out there? Gynocentrism. The world is focused and centered around the safety and well-being of women, right? At the expense of men. Of course, the expense of men is not something that is brought into the equation. They only think about, but we've got to take care of these women, you know? So circumcision, suicide, male spaces. <laughs> Female spaces are all over the place. Oh, it's wonderful. I have women all together. Women bars, women this, women that, women, women dry cleaning, women... <laughs> Women parking spaces. I mean, everything. Women, women, women. But men? Mm -mm. No way, Jose. Male spaces are oppressive. You know, that's, that's where men gather to oppress women. <laughs> Gynocentrism. You know, shorter sentences. You know, that's 62% shorter sentences for women for the same crime as men. Same crime, but they get 62% of the sentences. And we could go on and on. War death, workplace deaths, longevity. You know, men live shorter lives than women. No one cares. If it had been women living shorter lives than men, I'll bet you there'd be commission after commission on it. You better believe it. Domestic violence. You know, the whole domestic violence thing where we know now that at least 50% of the victims are males. But we have the Violence Against Women Act which focuses on helping women and not men. Gynocentrism. Can you see how it's working? It's working all the time. And people who, you know, the legislators who put that legislation together, they didn't think about that. Their immediate response was, we've got to take care of the women. They're the vulnerable ones. They're the ones who need our help, right? <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Reproductive choice, you know? Women's choice, her body, her choice, right? Man's wallet, her choice. It's like gynocentrism. Everything is female-centered. False accusations. You know, we could go on and on and on. But the important thing here is that just about every men's issue is is filtered by this whole gynocentrism thing, you know, which looks at the needs of women and kind of ignores the needs of men. This is not something that's hard to see. If people can look at it, they can see it. But you see, gynocentrism helps people avoid looking at it. You have blinders. You just don't see it. You look some other way, you know? Oh, boy. You know, another way to look at the, the impact of gynocentrism is to look at racism. You know, racism is ran silent and ran deep back in the mid-20th century. I know I was born in the mid-20th century, and I remember what it was like. And there were these, it was like, it was just in you, this, this sense that black people were not as good as white people, you know? And we got this idea from where? From the water cooler, from the research, and from the media. All of those places basically pushed people to believe that blacks needed white people in order to be cultured, in order to be moral, you know? All kinds of things. And everyone can see that now. We look at it and we almost snicker and say, gosh, that was stupid. That was ridiculous. How could we have automatically 
judged a whole group of people based on the color of their skin. It just doesn't make any sense. But guess what? Gynocentrism bears some resemblance to racism because it too is, is running silent and running deep. You can't see it. There was this great little book, big book actually, on black sociology um, that came out, I guess, in the, what, maybe at the turn of the century, I forget, I mean, 2000. And what it did was it looked at the whole deal of how sociology up until this point was pretty much a white kind of thing, right? And these black sociologists said, no, we're going to turn it around. We're going to look at it from a different perspective now. And they really did. It's quite a book. It's a fascinating book. But let me give you a couple of ideas from that book, and, and we can see how they're close to what we're seeing now with gynocentrism. So one of the things they said was, Blacks are defined as the perpetrators and creators of social pathology and not as its victims. Let's say that again. Blacks are defined as the perpetrators and creators of social pathology and not as its victims. Interesting, right? And that's pretty much right. I mean, that's how they were defined. They were not seen as someone who deserved to be helped. They were seen as a problem. But guess what? Now we can replace that blacks with men. Let's listen to how it reads. Men are defined as the perpetrators and creators of social pathology and not as its victims. All of the things we talked about before, circumcision, domestic violence, false accusations, all of those things plays right into this. Men are now seen as the perpetrators and creators of problems, not as victims, not as a group that needs to be helped in some way. All right? Very similar. Now, it's not the same. I'm not saying that racism and gynocentrism are the same thing. I'm just saying some of these dynamics underneath are very similar. It can help us see how the gynocentrism is actually in us. It's embedded in what we think and do. Here's another thing they said. Blacks are better if they're around whites. <laughs> Blacks are better if they're around whites. That was the myth, right? And now what do we have? Men are better if they're around women. You know, this Division 51 craziness. Uh, I remember when I was on the mailing list, one of the guys on the list, and everyone applauded. Grrr! He said something to the effect of, um, when men can be more like women, the world will be a better place. You know, in other words, men need to learn from women how to be human. And that's the kind of the same thing we were saying to the blacks. The blacks needed to learn from the whites how to be human, you know. And now it's switched over. It's the men need to learn how to be human, right? Oh, boy, and no one sees it. No one sees it, but it's potent and it's there. Research showing blacks were superior to whites was hidden from public view. That's what these sociologists found. The research that showed blacks as being in, superior to whites was hidden. It was, it was pushed away. You couldn't see it, right? Oh, boy. And same thing with the media. Of course, if the research pushed away, the media just keeps the song and dance going, too. But guess what? Now it's the men's stuff that gets pushed away. Now the research on men that shows men as being good, as being fine the way they are, gets pushed away. You don't hear a thing about it. And actually, there is quite a bit of research out there but you don't hear about it because nobody's pushing it. Media is certainly not pushing it. Oh boy. The psychological research of the day in the early to mid 20th century was not geared to help blacks, to, but to blame them and chronicle how they need to change. Hmm. Get the idea? And the same thing is true now for men. Let's, let's put men in that sentence. The psychological research of the day now is geared uh, is not geared to help men but to blame them and chronicle how they need to change i'd say that's pretty much true outside of the couple of pieces of research we're going to talk about later on can you see how the world is automatically gynocentric it holds men as being the problem and needing to take care of women and it holds women as being basically blameless 
blacks are immoral. I mean, that was the that was the general trend that these black sociologists found was out there was the blacks are immoral. Just by their nature, they're immoral. And the same thing is seen now with men. Men are toxic. Masculinity is toxic, right? Interesting, you know that the one of the things the activists, the black activists, did in the late '60s, and I remember this very well. They said black is beautiful. Black is beautiful. What were they doing? What were they doing? They had a whole population of black people who had lived under this idea that they were immoral, they were less than, they were subhuman in some ways, right? They turned it all around. They said, black is beautiful, which stopped people's world. It stopped their world. And these people who'd been just, just under the weight of all these judgments for so long suddenly started thinking, black is beautiful? What in the hell are they talking about? Black is beautiful? But that woke some people up. It woke them up from this terrible place that they'd been, where the research, the media, and the water cooler had all been there to push them down and make them feel inferior. Now the activists are coming up saying, oh, you know, black is beautiful. What a great idea. And it's, I stole that idea to produce the idea men are good because it's kind of the same thing. Men have been downgraded for decades now. Men have been pushed into a trash bin. They're toxic. They're this. They're the problem. They're causing all of this, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it's taken a toll on men and their, their way of looking at themselves. So when you say men are good, that's a big bite out of gynocentrism. Because it wakes people up. I remember this one time. I was this was years ago when I was first coming up with the idea of men are good, and uh, I had a possible logo on my screen, on my computer screen that I was working on. My my office was there, and I had a client, and, and uh, she was leaving. You know, and she saw the computer screen. She saw the logo that said "Men are good," and she looked at it. And she goes, "Yeah, right," in a sneering sort of way. And as soon as I heard that. I knew I had the, I was on the right track. Ah, that's exactly what I wanted. You know, I wanted someone to be challenged by that. You know, so that's where men are good came from. And we're getting off topic here a little bit, aren't we? Let's stop there for now. What do you say? Okay, so I think we're seeing how gynocentrism plays into things in just about every men's issue, and how men in general are judged really harshly, and a part of what makes that happen is the gynocentrism. But then along comes feminism in the 1960s and 70s. What do they say? They say, no, there's no such thing as gynocentrism. In fact, they don't even mention it. You know, they say women were oppressed in the 19th century and even in the 20th century. Women were oppressed. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> well, that doesn't fly with what we've just been talking about, how men are disadvantaged in so many ways. How could they say that? I mean, it's like they're going from precious to persecuted. <laughs> Wait a minute. And you know what? Let, let's look at the early 20th century, late 19th century. And I want you to go back and look at the diaries of your ancestors and read those, because don't read feminist history. That's not going to help you. Read the actual words written by people who were living at the time and listen to what they talk about. What they talk about is women were revered. Women were held in high esteem. When were, women were held as precious, right? In fact, the reason they didn't want women in the workplace was to protect them from the evil world. Right? Literally. You'll hear that. You'll see that when you read what people are talking about. You know, it was a matter of protecting. It's a matter of valuing them highly. You know? And so feminists took this being valued highly and precious and transformed it into being persecuted. What? Absolutely insane idea. Now, why were they able to get away with this? Why were they able to get away with this? Why is it that feminism can come in and say something that is completely erroneous and everyone goes, oh, poor dear. Gynocentrism. 
Gynocentrism says, oh, when women complain, we need to listen. When women have hardships, we need to listen. And so all they had to do was say, I have a hardship. You know, I've, I'm struggling with this thousand pound weight. Of course, it's only three ounces, right? And everyone goes, oh no, a thousand pound weight. And you get a guy who comes in and he says, I'm struggling with this thousand pound weight. And he's really got 500 pounds. And they go, oh, do it yourself. Take care of it yourself, pal. You know, gynocentrism, you see how it works? So feminism actually was pushed by gynocentrism. You know, because it made it easy. I, I think of feminism as being a downhill effort. You know, they're going downhill. You know, you're riding a bicycle down a hill. You're just doo, 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 doo. Whereas if you try and get things for men, you're going uphill. Why? Because the world is based on being female-centered and people think of women needing things. People think of women needing services, but they do not think of men needing services. They think of men needing to get off their ass and take care of women. Mm, that's the bottom line. So one of the things I do agree with feminism about is feminists say boys and girls are influenced by a culture that pushes boys to succeed and take effective action and girls to nurture and focus on appearance. Yeah, I, I have to go along with that. So we've got one side with the boys who are pushed to take action and the other side with the girls who are pushed to be sweet and to take care of their appearance and la, 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 la. Okay. But what they leave out is something really important. <laughs> what they leave out is, now in the 21st century, um, we've changed things. So yes, girls are actually, um, if they work on their appearance, that's that's good. And if they work on their being nurturing, that's good too. But they are also given the leeway to be, you know, active and to to uh, try and succeed and to push themselves to, to take effective action, right? They're blessed for that. Oh, you go girl. Oh, that's wonderful. So girls have both the traditional, you know, the nurturing and the appearance stuff, and now the action the movement, the taking charge stuff. So they've got it both. But what do the guys have? You know, the guys don't have either one because now when guys are active, when guys are pushed, you know, to, to try and take effective action, they get shamed. They get shamed. In fact, men taking effective action is a lot of times called toxic. <laughs> So you see the world we're living in? You know, one is a world where girls are encouraged to do anything. Oh, you can do anything. Obama's quote was, girls can do anything boys can do, even better, even in heels. Oh, man. Gynocentrism runs rampant. You know, he's blessing the girls and forgetting the boys. You know, that's gynocentrism. That's the way this whole crap works. So we've got now a world where... Everyone sees women as being in need and everyone sees men as being, you know, needing to be more like women. And if they're not, they're more toxic. And, you know, it's interesting that actually males are moving to be more feminine in some ways, you know. And I think there's a lot of explanations for that. One of which is testosterone levels are going down. <laughs> and as testosterone goes down, guess what? You know, we're probably going to have less masculine traits. You know, that's my guess anyway. There's all kinds of things going on because, you know, boys are encouraged to be more like girls. So they're going to they're going to do what they need to do in order to get the girl, which may be need their, you know, be more feminine. And uh, who knows? But think of it. We're living in a world that's very gynocentric, that holds women in high regard and allows them to do almost anything and get away with it. And it holds men in lower regard and it keeps them down by calling them toxic. You're a problem. <laughs> do we live in two different worlds? Oh man, we do. Oh man, we do. But no one sees it. And because of gynocentrism, people simply don't see it. They don't see it coming. And they don't even think they have it. It's like racism in the 1940s and 50s. We didn't think we had racism. 
You know, it wasn't something we were conscious of. It wasn't something we were aware of. And in today's world, people are simply not aware of their gynocentrism. I wonder, you know, sometimes whether um, it's like we're peeling off layers for our evolution, our psychological evolution. And we have started to peel off the layer of racism. We're still working on it. And even we're, we're farther away from peeling off on top of that, the level of gynocentrism. It's like, you know, who knows what uh, evolution will bring. But I think that we're peeling off the layers of judgment of other people so we can get to the point where we don't judge people on whether they have a penis or not or, or whether they you know, their skin is a certain color, you know. Anyway, we're going to go now into... Um, oh, the other thing is the, the uh, lowering of... of uh, testosterone is very possibly related to endocrine disruptors. And we didn't talk about that, but I just thought I'd throw that in there because that's, you know, they talk about the whole testosterone coming down because of uh, the socialization. But I, I think it's endocrine disruptors just as much. And you can look up endocrine disruptors to, to find out what that means. But we're in trouble, you know, because plastics emit these, these estrogens that are impacting boys and girls and uh, women and men anyway. Where was I? Yeah, we're going to talk now. I'm going to go into part two of this whole deal. And part two is going to go into the three research-driven areas that really help us understand the different worlds of boys and girls, women and men. And those three worlds are this, testosterone and how it impacts our, our being as men. We're going to talk about... Um, well, we'll talk about the male hierarchy because testosterone basically fuels the male hierarchy. But we're going to talk about precarious manhood, which is another piece of research that you probably have not heard of that's out there that says that, you know, men are socialized every day to have to prove they're men. This is a very different world from women and girls who don't have to prove they're women and girls. You know, boys and men have to prove they are men. Honey, that's a different world altogether right there. And then the last one we'll talk about is moral typecasting. But those three things uh, will help you understand the whole male hierarchy thing. And the, the male hierarchy thing helps you understand men in a very different way. Because really what we need to do is to start to understand men. Once you really understand men, what drives them, what's there, why they make the decisions they do, the way they process emotions differently, all kinds of things. Once you understand them, it's easier to love them. It's easier to know who they are and quit with the crap, the judgment crap that comes from all the feminist stuff about men are not good enough. Men are hateful to women. <laughs> men only think about themselves. La, 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 la. You know the drill. Anyway, so stay tuned for part two and uh, hope you enjoy it. We'll see you. Men are good. Men are good. Glad you're here today. We're going to talk about something interesting. The four things that make the world of men and boys different from the world of women and girls. You know, we've been through 50 years of this BS crap about, you know, the first biggest lie of the 20th century was that women in the United States were oppressed. You know, we've done plenty of videos on showing how that was a bunch of BS. But there's another lie, too, the second biggest, and maybe the biggest, who knows, you can debate on that. But the uh, other lie is that all of our sex differences are due to socialization, or at least the primary amount of sex differences are due to socialization. It's the way we were socialized, and if only we can socialize boys in a different way, they will be more like the girls, and the world will be a better place. Have you heard that before? <laughs> I bet you have. That is some crazy stuff. That is really some crazy stuff. And we're going to talk today about the four things that prove that that is crazy. The four things are testosterone, the male hierarchy, precarious manhood, and moral typecasting. We're going to take those one at a time. Well, the first up is testosterone. Now, testosterone... <laughs> Just having more testosterone shows that we live in different worlds. I mean, boys and men have 10 to 20 times the amount of testosterone 
as the women and girls. And guess what that does? You know, for years they thought this testosterone stuff was all about violence and aggression and, oh, it's going to make men this terrible, violent guy and blah, 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 blah. And now with more refined research capacity, they're finding that, wait a minute, it's not about violence and it's not about aggression. It's about striving for status. Striving for status. That's what testosterone does. It pushes boys and men to try and be better, to try and get things done, to try and look like they're independent, to try and get as much status as they can. You know, work for more money or more fame or more education, maybe not today, uh, more power, more real estate, fancier car, taller. I mean, all of these things raise status up and up and up. So boys and men live in a world where they're pushed to strive for status. That creates a very different world than the world of women and girls where they don't have to strive for status in the same way. Ay, yeah, yeah. But testosterone has a lot of other things too. You know, along with striving for status, testosterone lowers fear. So it brings the men's and boys' fear down a notch, maybe two notches. And at the same time, it increases their willingness to take risks. Now, I want you to think about that. You've got someone who's going for a CEO job, and they're willing to take bigger risks, and their fear level is lower. Don't you think they'd be more likely to get the job? Yeah, I would think so. If they have a good IQ. But guess what? If they don't have a good IQ, what happens? It's called Darwin Awards. You know, if you mix lower IQ with a greater willingness to take risks and a lowering of fear, I think that tells us the story pretty much about why more men get the Darwin Award than women. And if you, those of you who don't know about the Darwin Award, it's these terrible awards they give to people who sometimes die in the process of doing something really stupid. And that's low IQ along with higher risk, higher testosterone, and lower fear. But it does more than that. You know, the, the uh, testosterone has the uh, capacity to lower our stress. It pulls the stress down. You know, think about Edison, you know. He tried strive for status, strive for status, strive for status, and it gave him this resiliency to keep pushing. Because it, it also, it brings what they call stress resilience. It, it, it cuts back on the stress. Fascinating. Then the last thing it does, Ay, ay, ay. Threat vigilance. Threat vigilance. Which means, okay, once you've gotten a certain amount of status, you better defend it if somebody challenges it. That's what testosterone does. It pushes men to defend that status if someone challenges you. Hmm. Think bar fights. Think low IQ and bar fights. Guess what happens? They're striving for status, striving for status, trying for status. Someone else says, you don't have any status. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, no, you don't. Kaboom! So again, you've got this threat vigilance, along with the lowering of fear, raising of risk, striving for status. It creates all sorts of things, both good and bad, but a lot of good that people don't really know about. And think about it. Just having these things going on at a much greater rate than in women and girls, don't you think that changes the world of boys and men? But have you ever heard anyone say anything about that? About how because boys and men get these higher doses of testosterone, their world has changed? Hmm. I'll bet you haven't. And you haven't heard much about the other four either. Okay, so the first one's testosterone. What's the second one? The second reason is the male hierarchy. Hmm, the male hierarchy. I mean, why is testosterone pushing men and boys to strive for status? Strive for status, strive for status, because that's what they need to move up in this male hierarchy. Starts to make sense when you think about the male hierarchy. And let's talk about that a little bit. You know, in nature, um, most mammals and some other animals uh, have the sexes, the two sexes are divided into two camps. 
One camp is called the competers, and one camp is called the choosers. Now, usually, it's the, the choosers are the ones who spend more time with childbirth, with taking care of children, with actually giving birth, and things like that. And the competers are the ones who compete to try and get the choosers to choose them as a mate. All right? Yeah, that makes sense. And it's really fascinating. They found that among the choosers and competers in all these animal populations, there are some very important differences between these two groups. The choosers are different from the competers. The competers are larger, they're more competitive, they're more violent, and they have shorter lifespans. Hmm. So generally, throughout the nature, you know, it's the competers who are bigger, stronger, are, are a shorter lifespan, more competitive, more violent. Why? Why are they like that? What possible reason could they have for being larger and stronger and more competitive, etc.? Because that's what they need in order to get the girl. They need to have those things in order to get the girl. You know, take an example. The um, um, bighorn sheep. Oh, man, the bighorn sheep. You know what do they do? The males run and boom, they butt heads. And they back off again and boom, they do it again. And they keep on doing this until one backs down. And the one who doesn't back down is the winner. And as they keep going and going, competing, competing, the final winner has the best access to the top-rated bighorn sheep females. Hmm. Same idea with the bowerbirds. The bowerbirds, the, uh, the males, for the first, I think it's five, six, seven years of their lives, they practice making these bowers. These bowers are these beautiful uh, things they make out of twigs and, and junk and trash and whatever. They, they make these beautiful bowers. And why do they do this? Why do they spend so much time making those bowers? Because the female chooses who she's going to mate with based on who makes the best bower. So the males get real serious about this bower stuff. And in fact, they'll go and sabotage other males' bowers in order to make sure they choose him as the mate, right? And sure enough, if they choose him, they choose his bower, bingo, they have sex in the spot, and that's that. So in both these instances, both the bighorn sheep and the bowerbirds, the males have to strive for some sort of status, right? And they use that status then to get access to the females. Now, what's really interesting is this is not always the way it is. Sometimes the competers are the females, not the males. I think seahorse um, population and, and uh, some birds, it's the females that strive for status and they compete in order to get the guy because he does more with childbirth and childcare and things like that. And guess what? In those populations, the female birds and and seahorses are larger, they're more competitive, they're more violent, and they have a shorter lifespan. So it's not just this striving for status stuff that makes a difference. It's not just your sex that makes a difference. It's whether you're a competitor or a chooser. Hmm. And men, as we can see from the testosterone piece, are pushed to strive for status in order to get closer and closer to the top where they can, like the bighorn sheep, they can, they can get the girl, right? Of course. I mean, it, it's fairly simple. I can remember when I was a little guy, you know, how would we choose sides as boys? Man, as boys, we'd choose sides that we'd all line, get in a big circle, and, and the two best guys would choose sides. And they'd choose the best guy they could for the first choice and the second choice, the next best and the next best and the next best. And in that process, guess what happens? You know, the boys start to understand where they are in that hierarchy. Well, I can remember when I was a little guy, I was never really good at sports, but I wasn't terrible. But I was hoping all the time, please not last. Please don't choose me last. Please don't choose me last. And I don't think I ever got chosen last, but that fear was there. I did not want to be chosen last. I knew there was something bad about being at the end of the hierarchy. But, you know, I never saw my daughter choose sides to play house. Hmm. So we're different. 
men and boys are in this hierarchical thing, you know, the, in order to get married, you know, the human populations, the way we strive for status and the way we compete is more complicated than the animals. You know, the animals, it's pretty clear. One is a chooser and one's the competitor. But both sexes actually compete with humans. The, the uh, women compete by what? By trying to be as attractive as they possibly can. And that's their main way of competing with each other. And they work hard at that. I mean, the cosmetics industry is a $64 billion industry. $64 billion. Compare that to $32 billion dollars which is the NBA, the NFL, and the MLB all combined. Just $32 billion. So cosmetics is, is really up there. So the women compete by trying to be as attractive as they can. The men compete by striving for as much status as they can get. Because the higher your status is, the higher you're going to go in this hierarchy thing. And the higher you are in the hierarchy, the more likely you're going to get the girl, right? Right? So men learn to strive for status. It's part of what we do. But guess what's happened here in the last 50 years? Those men who strive for status are now being shamed. Because striving for status, competing all the time, is seen as toxic. Something's wrong with you. You compete all the time. It's like some sheep psychologist goes to the bighorn sheep males, the young males, and says, Boys, don't butt heads. Don't butt heads. We don't want you butting heads. Butting heads is toxic. That would confuse those sheep, don't you think? Just like our boys these days are being confused by the mental health profession, telling them that they shouldn't be striving for status so hard. And what's really bizarre is that when girls strive for status, when girls try and compete, 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 and go higher and higher, they call that empowerment. Huh? We're living in a crazy place, man. Okay, so, you know, the um, testosterone is the fuel. It starts things off. And then the hierarchy comes along. And men are slotted then in this hierarchy based on how they compete and how they do. And the better they do, the more likely they're going to get the girl. The worse they do, the less likely. Now, can you start to see how... Men and boys are living in a different world than women and girls. They've got this juice that tells them to strive for status. Then they live in this status-driven spot where they've got to keep on trying and trying and trying in order to get the girl, right? Then they're told there's something wrong with you for doing that. And let's go to number three. So we've seen how boys and men have more testosterone, which pushes them to strive for status. We've seen how they have to live in this hierarchical world where they have to compete, basically, for uh, reproductive access. But there's a third thing that is important that you rarely hear about, and it's something called precarious manhood. Now, what the heck is precarious manhood? Scientists have started a study in the last 10 or 15 years, gone all over the world looking at what happens when boys become men, and guess what they found? They're not considered men until they prove it. Hmm, that's a little odd, because guess what? Girls, when they're, you know, have their period, they're considered women from then on. Now, don't you think that is kind of a living in a different world for boys to have to prove their manhood, and girls never have to prove a thing? Hmm, it's one to think about. So this research is fascinating. A man named Vandello has been at the vanguard of all of this, and he's done some fantastic work looking at how men are pushed, basically by our culture, uh, to prove they're men. What a bizarre concept. But the first thing Vandello says is that manhood must be earned. You have to earn it. It's not something that um, is just given to you. He says, like, the female, the women, the status is ascribed. It's something that just comes with the, the uh, maturity. You know, once women go through puberty, they're considered women, right? Men and boys, not so much. In fact, they, they found that you have to prove it all the time. You have to keep proving that you're a man over and over and over again. And the second thing Vandello found was that, guess what? It can be lost, 
you work hard to prove that you're a man and you can lose this at any time. And the loss is potent. I mean, you know, you go down in the hierarchy, of course, if you, if you lose this status, if you lose this manhood status thing. So men live in a world where they know that A, they have to prove that they're men and B, it could be gone in a moment's notice. I don't think women have much of a concept about what it's like to live in a world like that because they don't have to prove they're women. Very different from the man's situation. The third thing Vandela talks about is that proving your manhood has to be a public act. You have to prove it through what you do in public. Huh. So have you ever seen men proving their men in public, right? They get out there and prove their men and the women are kind of rolling their eyes going, what is that? Why can't he just let that go? Well, between threat vigilance and between having to prove in public that you're actually a man, uh, we can see now why men are more likely to push that hard and to prove that they're men. You know, because this is a big drop in status if he goes down in this precarious manhood judging thing. Now, what does precarious manhood do? What does it do? It's the slotting mechanism. It slots the male hierarchy. It shows who's at the top Who's at the middle and who's at the bottom? Think about it. Everything a man does slots him in this male hierarchy with precarious manhood. His job. You know, people always say, well, what do you do for a living? And they listen real carefully and he says, "Uh, I I, um, clean dishes at McDonald's. (laughs) What does that tell you? Boom. What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a doctor. Really? Can you feel the difference in those two things? Yes, you can. Because see, that's the whole slotting mechanism. That puts him in a whole hierarchy thing about where he is. Sports in general. Sports is what? Sports is a slotting mechanism for winners and losers. You know, winners and losers, the whole thing, a man's life. I mean, men love sports and they love the whole hierarchy thing in sports where, you know, you you look at these statistics, right? And it tells you who's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all the way down. Business is the same way. And sports and business are huge slotting mechanisms to show show where men are. And why do they do this? Why is precarious manhood the way it is? Why do men compete for ladies? To make it easy for the women to choose the right guy. Hmm, what are the men trying to prove? The men in precarious manhood are trying to prove, A, they have agency. That means they're able to go out there and get things done. B, they're trying to prove that they're independent. You know, an independent man is one who tells everyone else what to do, and no one tells him what to do, right? That's a man highly independent. So men will work hard to make it so that as few people as possible tell him what to do. And he'll make it so that, you know, you don't see it when other men tell him what to do or other people tell him what to do, right? Because, see, that drops him down in this whole precarious manhood. It drops him down in the hierarchy, and it drops him down in status. So men live in this world of status. You know, they have to. They have to. But unfortunately, guess what's happened? Now, this whole world of status has been turned into something that the psychologists call toxic. The feminists call it toxic. Oh, men striving for status. Oh, men being slotted and wanting to win, wanting to come up on top all the time. You know, he's toxic. He wants to win all the time. He's toxic. Can you see how crazy that is? Men are in this naturally in this world through their biology, through the culture all around the world telling them they have to prove their manhood. And trying to be as high in that hierarchy as he possibly can. And now, instead of getting admiration and respect, he gets shame. And he gets called toxic. And now the very last one. It's called moral typecasting. Moral typecasting. What the heck is that? Before I tell you what it is, let me tell you a story. You know, when I was working in therapy with with men and women who were traumatized for well over 30 years... I'd see men and women who'd been through some horrendous stuff, you know, plane crashes, house fires, deaths of children, all kinds of horrible things. Sometimes I'd work with both the man and the woman, the husband and the wife, who'd experienced some sort of big trauma. And it became very clear after a while that the woman's pain and the man's pain were treated very differently by the people in their communities. Generally, 
people would run towards the woman and say, Oh, how are you? Tell us how you're feeling today. How is it different from how you felt yesterday? You know, what can we do for you? Can we bring you this? La, 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 la. Tell us your story again, right? But the man, if he was lucky, he'd have someone come up to him and, and say, How's your wife doing? <laughs> it's like they weren't really asking him about his pain. They were asking about his wife. No one wanted to touch it. So I, I coined this phrase, and the phrase goes something like this. A man's pain is taboo, and a woman's pain is a call to action, because that's exactly what it seemed like. It seemed like when people saw women were in pain, they were called to action. They wanted to do something to help. And when a man was in pain, they wanted to just scurry away. Hmm. So it just made me wonder about what the heck is going on here, because it didn't add up. It didn't make any sense. And along comes Kurt Gray. I guess it was maybe 10 years ago. And he starts studying what they call moral typecasting. Moral typecasting. Now, what the heck is that? What Gray found was that they would, um, people automatically and instinctively will see a moral situation in a dyadic pair. So there's a pair going on in this moral situation where one is what he called the agentic type. Now, the agentic type is the one who does the good or evil to the other person. That's the person who can take action, right? Then there's what they call the patiency. The patiency is the one who has something done to them. And Gray looked at this and he said, and you know, not only that, but these two are mutually exclusive. So the people who are seen to have patiency are rarely seen to have agency. And the people who have agency are rarely seen to have patiency. Okay. And Gray went a step farther, and he looked at how people responded to each. And the agency types, people thought, well, they need less support. They don't need so much support, you know, these agency types. And they saw this agency type as being more blameworthy. Mm. And they saw them as deserving punishment. You know, when they did something wrong, they saw this group, this agentic group, as deserving punishment, right? Oh, boy. Now, the patiency group was completely different. The patiency group, people were seen as victims. They were seen as needing support. And they got compassion and understanding. People assumed this patiency group was in greater pain and that they were more worthy of help and they would garner more help in the process. Wow. So remember, these two are mutually exclusive. So one is patiency. One is agency. One gets all the support. The other doesn't get very much at all. Well, that's the beginning of moral typecasting. But then recently along comes another researcher by the name of Tanya Reynolds. And Reynolds asks an important question. She says, well, is there a gender component in this moral typecasting thing? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Oh, yes, there is. Reynolds studied, she, I think she did six or seven studies, looking at whether there was a gender component in moral typecasting. And what did Reynolds find? She found that, hmm, people will assume that women have patience, And people will assume that men have agency. What does that translate to? That translates to exactly what I saw when I was doing therapy. That the women are going to be a call to action. People are going to focus on their pain. Oh, she needs more support. Poor dear. And the men are going to be seen as not needing support at all. In fact, if they did something, the finger will be shaken at them. Two very different things. And here's something else Reynolds found was that, remember, it's mutually exclusive, and Reynolds found that when the woman, who most people assume has patience, does something wrong, right? She's the perpetrator of evil. Guess what? They automatically assume. <laughs> they automatically assume that she deserves understanding and support. So the patience rubs off even when she is the perpetrator. And I think it's easy to see that the reverse is also true. When the men are the victims they're not seen as having patience. They're seen as not needing support. You know, we can see that all over. So what does this do? This creates a scenario 
where boys and men are living in a different world than girls and women. Why? Because boys and men do not get immediate support for their troubles. They don't get a lot of people running to aid them when they're in trouble, whereas girls are more likely to get that kind of support. So this moral typecasting thing plays out in all sorts of areas, including men's issues. I, I, I think about suicide. You know, four times as many men commit suicide each year in the United States as women. No one seems to care. And the moral typecasting thing starts to make some sense of that because it says that people simply don't care about men, their emotions, their needs. They're seen as agentic. They can take care of themselves. Oh boy, then there's domestic violence. You know, this whole moral typecasting thing made it so simple for feminism to portray domestic violence as only the women are hurt. And these men, these bad men hurt these poor defenseless women. Can you see how the moral typecasting thing plays into that? People automatically see the woman as the victim and the man as the perpetrator, even though we know now it's about 50-50, right? But it's easier to push the idea of women being victims and men being perpetrators. And men end up getting no help at all. And think about it. Our legislators have the same difficulties. <laughs> They're victims of moral typecasting too. And so they don't think men need anything. Men are agentic. They can take care of themselves. But the women, they're tied to the tracks. We better help them. You know, workplace deaths is another thing. You know, the, the, how many men, it was 93% of deaths in the workplace are men. No one cares. Now we know a little bit more about why that is. But you know, this stuff is not just on a macro level. The moral typecasting stuff is on the personal level too. I mean, think about it. How many times have you listened to a man and his emotions in the last six months? Just listened to hear without judgment. Probably not so many. Warren Farrell talks about, uh, what does he say? Women want a man who's in touch with his feelings. But Warren says, well, actually, what they mean is women want a man who's in touch with her feelings because she doesn't want to hear about his feelings. I mean, we see this all the time in therapy. You know, the <laughs> therapists are not so interested in men's issues. They're interested in the women and taking care of the women. So it plays out all over the place. This moral typecasting thing definitely plays out in many areas, but most importantly, it plays out in changing the world of boys and men into something different from the world of girls and women. Now let's sum this thing up a little bit. We've talked a lot about these four different things and testosterone. Ladies, I have a question for you. What would it be like if you had stuff in your veins which was pushing you to strive for status and to win all the time? I'll bet you wouldn't like that so much. But guess what? That's what happens with the men. Yeah, and how about the hierarchy? How would you like it, ladies, if if all of a sudden you were judged as not being a woman because you weren't modest enough, or maybe you're judged as not being a woman because you didn't nurture well enough. Get the idea? What would that be like for you to be judged not being a woman based on characteristics that the culture decides, oh, well, that's just, you're not going to be a woman. So that's an amazing and important issue for men and women is this testosterone thing impacts boys and men more than it does women and girls and the whole hierarchy thing impacts men and boys in the world we live in and then precarious manhood oh my gosh you know we hear so much from feminists about toxic masculinity ay 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 toxic masculinity this toxic masculinity that but guess what the whole research on precarious manhood pretty much negates the ideas about toxic masculinity. Because, you know, toxic masculinity says, oh, men, they're going to be too dominant. Yeah. And precarious manhood says, we expect men in this precarious manhood scenario to be dominant, to be more dominant. Hmm. Toxic masculinity says, we, men, they're so competitive, they always have to win, 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 win. And the precarious manhood thing says, 
you know what? We expect men to be more competitive. That's kind of what they're in. That's the hierarchy they're in. They've got to be more competitive. And you could keep going. You know, the risk-taking and aggression is, oh, this terrible, the toxic masculinity is risk-taking and aggression. Oh, my goodness. But precarious manhood says, you know what? You can expect men to be take more risks and to be more aggressive. Hmm. And status, all these toxic men are status all the time. All they care about is status. Precarious manhood research says we can expect men to strive for status. So everything they say gets turned around on its head by this precarious manhood research. But the psychotherapeutic world doesn't really pay much attention to that, do they? Crazy stuff. And then the moral typecasting. You know, that's just one more piece of things. Or ladies... Imagine what the world would be like if no one cared about your emotions. No one cared about your feelings. What would that be like? Hmm? You wouldn't like it so much. So, boys and men live in different worlds. We need to start appreciating that for what it is. Not shame them for not being more like women. Because the bottom line is we know that men are good. As are you. Like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Come see me on Patreon. Come see me on Regarding Men. We'll look forward to seeing you. Take care.